find time to do revision, do past your paper. If there are items you cannot answer, try to study that topic, okay, for you to be able to answer that question. If you will not be able to answer the question, ask a friend or a teacher or your tuition teacher to help you to answer the question. Do not just simply skip, okay? And then put a mark on that question. Then if you have time, revise it again, try to answer on your own. In that way, you will know whether you learned that or not. So you will improve. Okay, so that is just a simple advice on how to do your revision. Now, let's proceed to the content of the physics syllabus. Okay, so let's start with this one. Well, of course, any mesh, uh, anything about physics, it contains, or everything about physics, it contains measurement. That's why most of the students are asking, teacher, why do we have so many formulas? Why do we have to remember the formulas this one for this uh, topic. There are so many formulas to remember like that. So of course, everything starts with measurement. And for you to remember those formulas, you have to practice, okay? You have to practice. If, even if you're not be able to perfect it, at least for sure you will improve. So practice to repetition until you remember, until you understand the concept, okay? So for measurements, you have these variables. You have the time, temperature, and mass. So for time, you have the stopwatch for you to measure or the clock, then temperature, you have thermometer, and then for the mass, you have the balance, okay? Then I separate here the length because in length, let's say for example, in this case, a ruler is used to measure length for distances between one meter or one millimeter and one meter because some of you for sure will ask teacher when are we going to use a ruler when are we going to use a ruler like that so this is the time if it's less than one meter and higher than one millimeter you can use the ruler then for even smaller length that is the time you're going to use micrometer screw gauge okay so the standard unit for length is meters then for volume to find out volume of regular object, you can use mathematical formula. Well, of course, you can use uh, formulas for spheres or any other uh, regular object or the shape of different regular objects. You can use different formula, mathematical formula. While to find out the volume of irregular object, irregularly shaped object, this is what you have to do. Put object into measuring cylinder with water you have to fill with the water or you have to fill the cylinder with water. Then when object is added, it displaces, displaces the water, then making water level, level rise and then measure this rise. Then that is the volume of the regularly shaped object. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a question. This one is a tricky question. If you're not going to read the question properly, for sure you'll get the wrong answer. So this is from paper two, February, March, 2021, just recent. A student has a measuring cylinder. You look at this one, huh? measuring cylinder, and also have balance, have balance. So students will think that this measuring cylinder and the balance should be used for this question, right? Because it is given on the question, but look at this one. Which of these could she use to find the volume of a small metal sphere or used to find the volume of a small metal sphere. So which one? She has no other apparatus available. So what will be the answer? Either measuring cylinder containing water or a balance, you are just going to measure the volume. So again, you can do the process of elimination for this one. Either measuring cylinder containing the water and the balance, so this one is wrong then the measuring cylinder containing water only. So you can only use the measuring cylinder. So that is the only thing that you need to measure the volume of the water, okay? Balance only, no, because it is for mass, neither the measuring cylinder nor the balance. So the answer should be letter B, okay? You read the question properly so that you'll not get the wrong answer and then do the process of elimination to get the correct answer. Next. Now, this one is the very common uh, topic in physics. 
the motion graphs. We have two different types of motion graphs. Students are very confused in this. They are usually confused in this, even though they know that the graph, if it's straight like that, it's constant. But they don't know what constant is that, whether it is constant speed or constant acceleration. For this one, you have to focus on what type of graph is that. Let's say, for example, this is a distance time graph. You have to see what kind of graph is that, because that will be the one to dictate what kind of motion the object has. Okay, so let's say, for example, this is distance time graph. So you have your distance in meters, then time in seconds. So these are the graphs. If it's straight line, it is constant speed for distance time graph. If it's straight line like that, horizontal line, it is not moving. If it's gradient is decreasing, so the speed is decreasing because the speed is actually showing on the gradient. If the gradient is decreasing, it means the speed is decreasing. And then for the other one, the speed is increasing. As much you can see, it is getting steeper. The slope is getting higher, okay? And, or the gradient is getting higher and that will be an increasing speed motion of the object. You see, this is distance time graph. Be mindful in the title of the graph, okay? Then here is for the speed time graph. The previous one is distance time graph. Here's, here's for the speed time graph. If you're going to take a look at this, they are just almost the same. They are just almost the same lines. Going up, straight line, then curve like that. But look at the difference. In a speed time graph, if it's straight line, it is constant acceleration. Okay. Students usually answer this one as constant speed. This one, they are just going to write constant speed because they are not mindful on the title of the graph. Okay, so you should be focusing on that. That is the first thing you have to look for when looking at the graph. Okay, so constant acceleration for the one that is straight line going up, constant speed, constant deceleration if it's going down as the time goes by, increasing acceleration when the gradient increases, and decreasing acceleration when the gradient decreases. Okay, now I'm going to show you a question regarding this topic. Okay, look at this one. This is May, June 2020, variant 43. Figure 1.1 shows two speed time graphs and A and B and two distance time graphs, C and D. You see, they are different. They are different. This is speed time graph, speed time graph. This is distance time graph and this is distance time graph so you have to be mindful of what kind of graph you are looking for or you you are looking at okay so let's try to answer the first one describe the motion shown by graph a you look at graph a so for graph a it is two marks now what do you think is the is the answer for the first one this is graph a is it is a speed time graph Okay, if it's speed time graph and it's going down like that, okay, correct, Yosheng. So this is constant deceleration. Now, if, what if you're going to write deceleration only? If you're going to write deceleration only, you will get only one mark. You have to look on the how on the marks of this kind of question. How many marks is that question for you to know what are the things you have to write? Whether you're going to write two things or just one thing like that so this one for you to get two marks constant deceleration for graph b you see this one is speed time graph again increasing deceleration i mean increasing acceleration one mark for acceleration and if you write increasing acceleration you'll get two marks and then for graph c this is distance time graph you see yeah this is distance time graph distance time graph so for letter c it will be decreasing speed and for letter d it's constant speed if you write deceleration that's correct also you write here deceleration that will be fine because decreasing speed is also known as deceleration okay now do you have any question about graph i want to see your response on the chat box clear okay so for everyone it is clear just let me know if you have any question or clarification so that we can 
uh, make it clear before we proceed to the next topic. Yes, Aiden, what's the question? Aiden? Okay, no need to screenshot. I'm going to upload this. I'm going to upload this so you just can see all the slides. Okay. So if you want, if you want to revise, you can see the slides. You can rewatch the videos that we are going to upload on Facebook. Okay, so next topic or next question is this one. Let's make it a bit complicated. May June 2020. At time 35 seconds, the airplane stops decelerating and moves along a ru the runway at constant speed at 6.0 meter per second for a further 15 seconds. He sketch the shape of the graph for the distance traveled by the airplane along the runway between time zero and time 50 seconds. You are not required to calculate the distance value. So you just have to know what, uh, what should be your or what should be the graph looks like? Okay, if it's decelerating, and this it is distance time graph. You look at it is distance time graph. You have to be mindful on that again. A distance time graph, because it if it's speed time graph, it will be different uh, figure. It will be a different graph. So it should be going like that until the thirty five, and then constant speed from thirty five to fifty, because at thirty five seconds airplane is decelerating so from 0 to 35 it's decelerating and then from 35 to 50 it is moving at constant speed you just have to show that it is a straight line like that okay so again you'll just go back to this speed time graph and then distance time graph okay then next, mass and weight. So mass, a measure of matter in a body and the body's resistance to motion. Remember that the higher the mass of the object, the harder it is to move, the higher it is to move. And also it is harder to stop when it's moving. And the mass will never change, whether if, if you go to the moon or to the Mars or to the outer space, it will be the same. The mass will never change. While weight, it depends on the gravity. It is the force of gravity on the body as a result of its mass, okay? So the weight is changing. If you go to other place or if you go to other planet which has different gravity, the weight will be different. If you go to outer space, your weight will be zero because there's no gravity there. There is no gravity there. So your weight is zero, but the mass will still be the same. So how will you solve the weight? The weight is equal to mass times gravity. Gravity on Earth, because that is the one we always or we usually use, G is always 10. So whatever the formula you will see, if there is a gravity, that is always 10. It is constant. Okay. Now weight and hence masses may be compared using a balance. Okay. Next is the density. So the density of a liquid place. How to measure? So place measuring cylinder on a balance. Add liquid, reading on measuring cylinder, then that will be the V of the liquid, the volume of the liquid. Then the change in the mass on the balance will be the mass. And then you can get the density by mass over volume. Okay, you get the volume of the liquid. No. You put the, the graduated cylinder or measuring cylinder on the balance. Then you measure the mass. Then you put a volume of liquid there, you put a volume of liquid on that, then whatever the volume of the liquid there, you have to record. And the difference on the mass on the balance, that will be the mass of the liquid. So you can get the density of the liquid like that. And you know, of course, what's the density? If it's density is higher than, ma uh, higher than water, so the object will just sink because its density is higher than the water. If density is lower than water, it will float into the water or on the water. Okay. Now let's try to answer this question. This is an easy question, but the problem is again, 
students do not read the question properly. Look, this paper four. A scientist fills a container with the seawater. The container has a dimensions. We look at this one. Dimensions of 30 cm by 30 cm by 40 cm. Then the density of seawater is 1,200 by uh, 1,020 kilograms per meter cube. Now, I know you know the formula to get the volume. I know you get. I know you know the formula to get the volume. But the problem here is, look at this one. It is meters cube. This one is cm. The tendency of the student is they're just going to solve this directly. You, you have to look at the units first. So for you to do that, you have to convert it into meters. So this 30 cm is 0 0.30 meters. Everything should be converted to meters first, 0 0.30 meters. And then this is 0 0.40 meters. You just divide it by hundreds. So you can solve the question already. Then use the formula. Density is equal to mass over volume. Okay. So the density is 1,020 equals the mass over volume. So what is the volume here? You just have to multiply. So 0.3 times 0.3 times 0.4, the answer will be 0 0.036. 0 0.036. Okay? Because it is length times width times height. Okay? So you can solve this one. 1020 times 0 0.036 equals the mass. Then you can get the mass. So 1,020 times 0 0.036, you'll get the answer. That will be, okay, 36.72 kg mass. Okay. Most of the time, students, they will just simply solve, compute, Okay, they type in the calculator, then they'll write the answer on the on the paper here. For example, if you're going to do that, if you're going to do that, you will lose marks. Because for example, in this case, it is three marks. If you're not going to write the solution, you will only get one mark like that. And if you're not going to write the units, you will lose marks again. So make sure you have or you will write the formula. And this is my tip or advice. You have to write the formula. Why? Because even if your answers are wrong, even if your answers are wrong, if you write the correct formula, you will get a mark or you will receive a mark on that. Even if your answers are wrong or the values that you write on your paper is wrong, write the formula. Because on that, you can get marks. Even if you're not getting the full mark, at least you'll get mark. Okay. Next, forces. So forces is measured in newton. So always in newton, always in n. Okay. Then force, the formula is mass times acceleration. Okay. This is what I want you to do, students. I want you to write somewhere. Let's say, for example, at the back of your notebook, the different formulas and the different units for different measurements or different quantities. On that, if you will be able to write all those formulas, all the units and symbols for different quantities, it will be easy for you to look at that. If you see questions, let's say, for example, if you see questions from or for force, about force, then you forget the formula, you look at the back of your notebook, then you will see there. Okay, instead of looking at the book, looking at anywhere on the part of your notebook, and it's hard for you to see, compile all the formulas and then write it at the back of your notebook or the place where you can see it easily. Okay, so every time you do computation, you look at that and then it will be easy for you to solve the problem. Okay, and then through that, through practice, you will remember those different formulas. Then, what is this Newton? Newton is the amount of force needed to give one kg an acceleration of one meter per second squared. So that is why it is mass times acceleration. Okay, so a force may be produced a change in size. So these are the effects of force change in size, change in shape of the body, or give acceleration 
or make it faster or make it slower. And it can also change the direction depending on the direction of the force. Okay, so these are the different effects of forces. Okay, so Hooke's law, a very commonly asked topic or question in uh, IG also. Springs extend in proportion to load as long as they are under their proportional limit. You look at this one. If you see a graph of uh, under Hooke's law or force and extension or of spring, you will see a straight line like this. It means if it's straight line like this, it's still proportional. It means the, when you double the force, the extension will be doubled. They are still proportional. But once they reach the time or the, uh, the part of the graph in, as what you can see here, it's like a curvy now. If it's curvy and it's not straight line anymore, it means it reaches its proportional limit or limits of proportionality. Okay, so straight line, it means it is still proportional. Now limits of proportionality, which load and extension are no longer proportional. And then look at the formula load or the force in newton then spring constant times extension later i'm going to show you what this extension means and why students tend to commit mistakes on this then in symbol it is f is equal to kx now let me show you a question about this one look at this october november 2019 the spring obeys hook's law so explain what is meant by this statement you can just simply memorize this one so it is extension is directly proportional to force extension is directly proportional to force and then this is what i want you to see okay b a chest expander is a piece of equipment used by athletes in a gym so figure 2.1 shows a chest expander that consists of five you look at this uh, five identical springs it's not written as figure it's written as word here five connected in parallel between two handles each spring has an stretch length of 0 0.63 meters and a stretch length of 0 0.63 meters two athletes are stretching the chest expander by pulling on the two handles in opposite direction look at this each athlete pulls the handle towards himself with a force of 1300 newtons now state the tension in each spring so what should be the way on how you will solve this problem students usually ask where did you get this value where did you get that what do you think is the way on how to solve this problem you don't need the formula for this one you just have to analyze the question there are five there are five identical springs identical means the same so each athlete puts the handle towards himself with a force of 1300 newton so how will you get how will you get the tension in each spring in each spring there are five springs so how are you going to solve that try to analyze this one there are five springs and each of the uh, person there exert 1300 newton in each side okay do you have to multiply okay you have to divide so you will make it 1300 divided by five because you are you were asked to identify the tension in each spring each spring there are five springs so you have to divide by five so 260 260 newton each spring okay very good jolton so that is 260 newton okay you see where did i get that five for sure students will ask that it is from the question okay next now this is the question that, that i want you to see the chest expander stretches and each spring is now 0 0.94 meter long 0 0.94 meters long calculate the spring constant of each spring so you have here the force the force or the load for each spring which is 260 right 
260. Then, the students will just simply do this. They're just going to divide because the formula is F is equal to Kx. F is equal to Kx. Student will just write X as 0 0.94. They will just write it as 0 0.94. But they forgot that this X this x is extension. That x is extension. It's not the length of the chest expander or length of the spring. So what you need to do is to look from the previous question, 0 0.63. Originally, 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 the spring is 0 0.63 meters. Originally. Now, there is 0 0.90 long now for that chest expander, that is now the, the length of that chest expander. So how will you get, how will you get the extension? Okay, you have to subtract first. You have to subtract first, okay? Because students will just simply, oh, they see the 0 0.94. So that is the value of X. No, it's not like that, okay? X is extension, not the, not the length of the spring. So that should be 0 0.94 minus 0 0.63 so you have to subtract that to get the extension okay so that is the only extension 0 0.94 minus 0 0.63 so that will be 0 0.31 so you'll have 0 0.31 meters now is this clear so x is extension you have to subtract it first okay it's not that you saw the value, use it like that. So calculate the spring constant K of H spring. You know the force. The force is from the previous question. Remember class, questions in physics, they are always related from the previous one. They are always related from the previous question. Okay. If they ask you to calculate the first one, uh, most of the time they're going to, uh, to, you're going to use that value for you to answer the second question okay so the force on the first one is 260 equals so k times the extension 0 0.31 do not forget that that 260 divided by 0 0.31 equals the k now what is the k constant solve 260 divided by 0.31 so you'll get 838 for 839. Okay, 839 constant. What is F? Newton over meters. You have to include the unit. Without the unit, your marks will be, or you will not get the full mark. So that is a spring constant. Or you can write the 840. That will be acceptable. Spring constant, it means for you to extend the for you to extend the uh, the spring by one meter, for you to extend the spring by one meter, you need a force of eight hundred thirty nine newton for this case. Spring constant it means you need to supply that force for you to extend the spring by one meter. So that is spring constant. Okay, or sometimes it is in cm, but in this case it is meter. It means you need to exert 839 Newton force to extend the length of the spring by one meter. So that is spring constant. Okay, next, let's proceed to the next one. So this is the moments and then scalars and vectors. Now, this is a very confusing kind of question for students already. I'm going to show you a question later. A scalar is a quantity that only has a magnitude. Okay, so this one is easy. Scalar quantity contains only magnitude, okay? Then a vector quantity has direction as well as magnitude, okay? Make sure you remember that because they're just asking questions sometimes. What is vector quantity? What is scalar quantity? And then give example. If it has direction, it's vector. If it doesn't have direction, it's scalar, okay? So calculating resultant force, calculating resultant force. I'm going to show you how you will answer this kind of question. Look, 
So this is a very difficult question for Marx. This is a 40, uh, variant 42, February, March, 2021. So this is latest also. You see this fig figure, okay? Figure 2.2 shows the force acting on an object. Draw a scale diagram to determine the resultant force acting on the object. The state the scale and or scale that you use. Okay, so how are you going to do that? Okay, you have to set the scale first. You have to set the scale first. Let's say, for example, you are going to use, uh, let's say, 40, so five. One cm is equal to five newtons. So one cm is equal to five newtons. You have to set the scale first for you to get the correct answer. So one cm is equal to five newton. So as what you can see here, this one is 20 newton. This is 30 newton. So you have to divide it by five each. So let's do that. So let's write it here. So 30 newton divided by five is equal to six. So it means you have to draw it as six cm. You have to draw it as six cm. Then the other one is 20 newton divided by five. It means it is 4 cm. So you will use 6 cm for the for the 30 newton and then 20 uh, 4 cm for the 20 newton. Okay, so that is the scale you're going to do. And then make sure you're going to use a calculator. I mean calculator, protractor. Okay, so you have the one that is 6 uh, 20 newton. Make sure you're going to measure this one. So let's say this is 4 cm. You have to measure it as 4 p.m. Okay. Then you measure the angle. You may measure the angle. Make sure it is 60 degrees. 60 degrees. So let's write 60 degrees. Okay, it is 60 degrees. Okay. So let's just put that one. 60 degrees. And then you measure 6 cm 6 cm like this i'm just showing it like that uh, but in reality you have to measure so this is 6 cm okay 6 cm okay 1 cm previous question is no it's not from the previous question you you are going to set that you are going to set the scale you can make it 4 cm i mean 1 cm is equal to 4 newton it's up to you just make sure that when you use it in computation, uh, I mean, in your diagram, you are going to use the correct measurement, okay? Now, after that, you will do a parallelogram method. A parallelogram method. What is a parallelogram method on this case? This is 4CM. You will draw a 4CM here also. You will draw a 4CM in this case also on that side. So this is 4CM. It is parallel here. This one and this one should be parallel with each other, okay? And then the other one is 6 cm, here. 6 cm should be parallel to this one also, so 6 cm. So they are both 6 cm. So 6 cm and then 6 cm. You understand? Okay, now let's, Say, for example, you get this value, and then the resultant is this. The resultant is this. This is the resultant. Let's write here resultant. Resultant. That line is the resultant. Okay. So you just have to draw di the diagram, but make sure, yes, use ruler. You can use ruler to measure that. You can use ruler to measure that, and then you'll get the answer, okay? Just make sure that your measurements are accurate. Just make sure that your measurements are accurate. Your drawing are accurate. Whatever the answer here, whatever the answer here, let's say you, put, you make it as, let's say this is six, four, let's say this is seven or eight, eight, okay, 8.8, let's say 8.8 .8 cm. If it's 8.8 .8 cm, now you can get 
you can get the magnitude of the resultant force. This will be 8.8 .8 times 5. So you will get the, the answer. So 8.8 .8 times 5, 8.8 .8 times 5, that will be 44. So this is 44 Newton. Because your scale, your scale is 1 cm is equivalent to 5 Newton. Yes, it can be any number. If you can use 3, you can use 4, but the ideal here is 5 for you to divide it easily. 20 divided by 5, you get 4. But you can use 6, you can use 3, you can use 4. Understand it then? Okay, just ask if you have any question so I'll be able to answer. So this is 44 Newton. Okay. Then, how about the direction? Direction of the resultant relative to the direction of the 20 Newton force. Then you can just simply measure the angle. You can measure the angle here. And then you can put your answer here. Okay, let's say, for example, it's 40 degrees, 35 degrees, or 38 degrees. You just use a, a protractor to measure the angle. Okay, so that is how you answer questions like this. You, you have to set, no, it's not like that. You have to uh, set the scale first. Okay, so you have to set the scale first. Okay, let's proceed so we can discuss more. Next is the momentum. So momentum, the product of mass and velocity. So it is mass times velocity. Okay. The next is energy. Okay, so you have kinetic energy, then gravitational potential energy. I know you're familiar with the formulas already on this. And then efficiency. Efficiency is useful energy output over energy input times 100, or it could be useful power output over power input times 100. Just a clue, because some of you still confused in which one is output, which one is input if the question already stated which one but sometimes they are not directly stating which is the in output which is the input just remember output is always smaller than input the smaller value is always the output the bigger value is always the input just a clue okay if the question is too complicated for you to understand remember that the output is always smaller than the input Okay, for you to get the efficiency. Now, I put here a question. This is a commonly asked question also for paper four. You look at this. Figure 3.1 shows a waterfall. Describe the main energy transfer which is taking place as the water falls. This waterfall has height, has height. So if it is having height, what energy is that? Okay, GPE. So it has GPE. Now look at this. It is two marks. So it's not as simple as that. It's not as simple as that. So you have to think how you will get the two marks. If you just write here GPE to kinetic energy, you'll get one mark. It's just one mark. You have to think of other things for you to get the two marks. So it will be like this one. Okay, very good, Jing Ying. It should be GPE or GPE to ke and then ke to sound you can write here sound or heat energy so always like that you have to analyze you have to think how you will get two marks if you write the gpe to ke which is correct but you will only get you will only get one mark for that why not plus why not plus okay you look at this one it has G gpe on top GPE here, let's write this properly. You have here GPE. Then as it is going down, as it is going down, you have kinetic energy. Once, once it hits the water here or some rocks here, it will produce sound. Sound or heat. Actually, you can put here sound or heat energy. Sound or heat energy. You can do that. Okay. It's not just simple as 
GPE to KE, that's only one mic. You have to analyze. Aside from that, what else will happen to the energy that is present on the diagram? Okay. Then, next, describe the main energy transfer which is taking place as the waterfall. Describe the main energy transfer. So that is the first question. So let's do the number two. The speed of the water as it hits the bottom is 21 meters per second. Calculate the height. You look at this one. They give the speed, but they are asking you the height. I chose this question because this is a bit complicated. Calculate Ke first. No, you have to. You have to combine the two. You have to combine the two. Okay, let's look at the previous question. You have here 3.1 shows a waterfall. There is no mass given, right? There is no mass given. You cannot solve the KE. You cannot solve also the GPE. So what are you going to do? They only gave the speed. Okay, they only gave the speed and they are asking you to find the height. Okay, look at, look at this one. An object that is falling down, let's say, for example, you have, there is a ball that falls down. The ball here has GPE. It has GPE. When it is falling down, when it is falling down, the GPE will all be converted to KE. That will be converted to KE. Okay. And then you can assume, you can assume that GPE is equal to KE. It means all the GPE will be converted to kinetic energy. That is an assumption. GPE will all be converted to kinetic energy. Now, look, what is the formula of GPE? This one you are familiar. This is easy, MGH. And then kinetic energy, you know the formula also, one half MV squared. You know this formula, right? Now you have to combine this formula for you to be able to solve the answer. They gave you the uh, speed. They're asking you to solve the height. Okay, it's like, how? It's like impossible, right? But you just have to combine these two formulas and assume that all the GPE will be converted to KE. So you can make it GPE is equal to KE and what's the formula for GPE, which is MGH is equal to formula of KE, which is one half MV squared. Now, the mass here, because it is the same object, it is the same object, the mass can be canceled out because they are the same mass, okay? So let's, let's simplify it. It will be MGH, okay, you divide both sides by, let's do a mathematical way to solve this one. You can divide it by MG, MG. For you to cancel out mg on both sides i mean on, on the other side so you canceled out mg here you canceled out mg here you canceled m you canceled m because the mass are the same so you can get the height so the height is equal to one over two then v squared then over 2g over 2g two. G. Okay, look. Any question about this? Or you can make it 1 over 2 V squared over G. You can make it like this one. You can also do it like this. Height. Height is equal to 1 over 2 V squared. It's just the same. Then over, over G. It will just give you the same answer. Okay, now let's solve. So H is equal to one half multiplied by the V is 21 squared and then divided by two over two, over two like this, okay? So this is an exponent. This is exponent uh, that is in there. So let's solve. So H is equal to 
So, 1 over 2. 1 over 2 times 21 squared over 10. Uh, y2. Wait, wait. Uh, it's, let me erase this one. It's over 10. G is always 10. Okay. G is always 10. Okay. So, 1 over 2 times 21 squared divided by 10. So, the answer will be 22.05. So, 22.05 meters. So that will be 22.05 meters. Standard unit meters. Any question? Okay. So it's just like that. Okay. Now explain any assumptions you made. So you can write there all GPE are converted to KE or you can just simply write there no energy lost. Or you can write all GPE will be converted to kinetic energy. Or you can simply write no energy lost. Okay. Next. Okay, work and power. So for work and power, work is done whenever a, fo a force makes something move. So when you apply force on something and that something moves, that is work. So the unit of work is joule, same as excuse me, energy. So one joule of work is one Newton force moves an object by one meter. So in formula, that's just W is equal to FB. And then power, power is the rate, the rate, how much or how fast, how fast the work is done. So the unit for power is what? You have to remember the unit. Huh? That's why I'm asking you to write formulas at the back of your unit. These units are very important. If you write it, you will. Okay, you will lose mark. Then power is work done over time taken in seconds. It's always in seconds. Again, always in seconds. Keep in mind that when you are doing computation, including time, make sure it is in seconds. Okay? Then pressure. Pressure is the force per unit area. So force over area. And unit is Pascal. But Pascal is just Newton per meter squared. If it's Newton per cm squared, it's not Pascal. Pascal is just Newton per meter squared. Okay? Then in liquid, liquid pressure, it is density times gravity. Again, you see the gravity and then height. Gravity I is always equal to 10. So this is G which is always equal to 10. So therefore, as the depth of a fluid increases, when you go deeper under the liquid, the pressure will increase because it is related to the height. But the shape doesn't affect the pressure of liquid. Remember that uh, shape will not affect the pressure of a liquid. It's the height that affects. So whether it is like this one, this shape and this shape of the object, they will have the same pressure. They will have the same pressure if the height are the same. Or it's the same like that. Okay? The, the pressure that the object experienced here is the same pressure that the object here will be experiencing because they have the same height. Okay? Now, how to measure pressure? You have the manometer and the mano manometer, uh, barometer. So manometer, you're going to measure the height difference. Most of the time, this is where you are going to use the formula density, gravity, height. Most of the time, they are using the formula in this uh, diagram. Okay, This is measuring pressure difference. Manometer measures the pressure difference. Pressure here and pressure here. The difference on the pressure on that. Then you have the barometer. Barometer is used to measure 
atmospheric pressure. It's used to measure atmospheric pressure. And then most of the time, you'll just ask, what is this? What is inside that? Inside that is vacuum. It's not gas. If you write gas there, it's wrong. It is vacuum. Vacuum means there's nothing inside. Okay, there's nothing inside. And then the height here that you're going to measure is from this point up to this point only, not here. Okay, I saw questions like this. They put here as zero. This is two. This is two. And then this is, let's say, for example, this is 14. Now they are asking, what is the pressure? What is the pressure? So it should be 12, 12 mmHg. Okay, it should be 12 mmHg, 12 millimeters mercury, not 14. Okay, you have to look at the top and then the bottom there until there only. Not here, not here, not there. Okay, it's only there on the liquid. Okay, then look at this question. Figure 4.1 shows a mercury barometer. The tube containing the mercury is vertical. So the height H indicates the value of the atmospheric pressure. So that's the height. That is contained in the space labeled X. What do you call X here? Okay, so this is vacuum, not gas, not air. It's vacuum. Vacuum is different from gas from air because vacuum, it means empty space. Nothing is there. Okay, so this one, you have to write there vacuum. Okay, the next. So thermal physics means about heat. So simple kinetic molecular model of matter. So it's the same as in chemistry. Okay. Particles of solid, lattice formation, they only vibrate in place, they cannot move. Particles of liquid, they, they can slide past through each other. There are some spaces, they are in irregular arrangement. Gases, they are freely moving. There are a lot of spaces between each particle. The forces of attraction is least here. The forces of attraction is highest on solid. That's why they cannot move freely. So Brownian motion, gas mole molecules move randomly. That's why when you put a simple particle here, let's say, for example, a grains of something or a smoke particle, you will see it is moving in random direction because it is continuously hit or collide with the gas molecule. That is Brownian motion because the molecules repeatedly collide with the particles, whether it is smoke particles like that and others. Okay, then evaporation. Evaporation is the escape of more energetic particles from the surface of the liquid. You look at this, more energetic particles from the surface of the liquid. Surface means on top of the liquid only. Here is the liquid, for example, surface is this part. Surface is this part. So they only escape on that part okay on the surface so if more energetic particles escape the liquid contains energy particle temperature will decrease i put this one because this uh, concept is very commonly asked in exam actually i put that here describe in terms Evaporate. So what happens when liquid evaporates? Look how many marks it, this one. How many marks is it? In this four marks, you have to write four concepts about this for you to get the full marks. So I have shown you earlier. More energetic molecules escape from the surface of the liquid. So this is one mark. This is another mark. Then Less energetic molecules are left behind. So what's going to happen? Temperature of the liquid decreases because the average kinetic energy of the remaining molecule is lower. Okay, that's why they are escaping. That's why when you have coffee, you prepare coffee, which is very hot, and then eventually it becomes cold. Why? Why is it becoming cold? Because the more energetic particles escape 
they evaporate, they escape from the surface of that coffee or of that liquid, then the low energetic particles remain, remain on the uh, liquid. So that's why it becomes cold also. Or the heat also was uh, escaped from the surroundings. Okay, but that is one factor for it to become colder. Okay, there are different factors. There are different factors to increase the rate of evaporation. Okay, we can use high pressure, so it will increase the rate of evaporation. Higher surface area or bigger surface area, or sometimes you can just simply blow air. That's why when you have coffee and then you blow air on that, it becomes colder faster, right? Then decrease the humidity. Okay, so you can look at that. Okay. Then pressure changes in gases. Okay. Pressure is inversely proportional to the volume at constant temperature. Pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. Meaning, if you increase the volume, if you increase the volume, pressure will decrease. If you increase the volume, pressure will decrease at constant temperature. If the volume increases and the temperature stays the same or stays constant, the particles hit the surface less often. It will hit the surface less often. You have to look, let's say, for example, in this one. This is the one, uh, one of the container and this the other container. Let's say, for example, there are five particles, five molecules of gas. Okay, let's have five. Same thing, you have five here. Okay. Now, why is it the why is it that pressure becomes lower if the volume, if the volume increases? If the volume increases, why is that pressure decreases? It's because Pressure is related to the collision. Pressure is related to the collision of the particles and the wall. If the volume is small, if the container is small, it can hit the wall frequently. It can hit the wall frequently, okay? Because it is less volume. While if you make the volume bigger, if you make the container bigger, it will travel further, it will travel further for it to hit the wall, for it to exert pressure. So collision, is the reason why gases exert pressure to the container or to its container. If you make the container smaller, frequent collision will happen. If you make the container or the volume bigger, less collision will happen. Okay? So let's say, for example, in this case, explain in terms of momentum. Okay, but this one is in terms of momentum, not collision. Uh, explain in terms of momentum okay of its molecules why the gas trap or why the trap gas exerts a pressure on the walls of the tube this is this is three marks okay this is three marks so you should know how you will get the three marks let me make it smaller Look at this one. First, molecules collide with the walls of the container. That is the reason why it exerts pressure. And then momentum of molecules changes. Yes, very good. And then the third one, this causes a force and that spreads out over area of wall. Okay. First one, of course, the reason why it exerts pressure, it's because it collides. Then if it collides, it will hit the wall then that momentum will change. And if the momentum will change, it will cause force and that spreads out all over the wall of the container. Okay. Now, why is it like this? Why there's no more or frequent collisions happen here? Because they are not asking or they're not writing here or they're not including anything about changing in temperature, changing in the pressure. They're not asking about that. They're just asking you to describe they're not asking, they're not showing here any changes happening. It's just asking you to describe. Okay. In terms of molecules, so always remember that it exerts pressure because it collides with the wall. Momentum of the molecules changes or undergo change of momentum. And then this causes the force. If there is a change in momentum, there is a force. 
Okay. So let's continue. Now, this is a computation about this one. A cylinder of volume 0 0.012 meters cubed contains a compressed gas at a pressure of 1.8 times 10 raised to 6 Pascal. A valve is open and all the all the compressed gas ex escapes from the cylinder into the atmosphere. The temperature of the gas does not change. Okay, so it means it's constant temperature. Calculate the volume that the escaped gas occupies at the atmos atmospheric pressure 1.0 times 10 raised to 5 Pascal. Okay, you look at the question. It highlighted escape, the volume that escapes. Okay, so let's use the formula first. P1, P1 is equal to P2, P2. So P1 is the pressure one. That is 1.8 times 10 raised to 6. So this is 1.8 times 10 raised to 6 times V1. V1 is 0 0.012 meters cubed. Okay, so that's the volume one, the first volume. Then equals, excuse me, P2. P2 is 1.0 times 10 raised to 5 Pascal times times V2. Okay, so we can solve this one now. 1.8 times 10 raised to 6 times 0 0.012 equals V2. So this will be over 1 1.01, 1 1.0 times 10 raised to 5. So let's solve. Try to solve this also. And if you'll get the, uh, the different, uh, a different answer, just let me know. Practicing your calculator also is needed here. So six times, times 0 0.012 divided by 1.0 times 10 raised to 5. Okay, what's the answer? Okay, the answer here is 0 0.216. That is the V2. But look at the question. It means this is the one, this is the one that remains. This is the one that remains on the container. This is the one that remains on the cylinder. It remains on the cylinder. But they are asking you, calculate the volume that escapes. The one that escapes. So what are you going to do? If you write this one, you'll get the correct, uh, you'll get the marks already. You'll get the marks already, but you will not get the full marks because it is asking you the volume that escapes. This is the one that remains. Wait, uh. What's the answer? Cylinder of a volume 0 0.012 meters cube contains a compressed gas of 0 0.1.8 times 10 raised to 5 Pascal. A valve is opened and all the compressed gas escape from the cylinder into the atmosphere. So the temperature of the gas does not change. Calculate the volume that the escape gas occupies at the atmospheric pressure 1.0 times 10 raised to 5 Pascal. So for this one, yeah, you just have to subtract. So 0 0.216, but don't forget to write the unit. Uh, I was not able to write the unit. You have to write the unit here. Then you just have to subtract. So this is 0 0.216 meters cube equals the V2. Okay. 
case. And then you just have to subtract. So 0 0.216 minus 0 0.012. And that is the one that, that escaped. That will be 0 0.204. 0 0.204. Okay, next. Okay, next one is the temperature can be measured by observing a physical property that changes with temperature. Examples, alcohol and then mercury used in thermometer. Okay, so this is about the thermometer. I'm going to show you this one. So this is a liquid in a glass thermometer. So this thermometer measures the at the temperature because of the liquid inside you know that when it's heated when it is heated it will expand the liquid here will expand now if it's hot it means the temperature is higher the liquid inside will increase in volume the liquid inside will increase in volume because it will expand when it's hot so when it's hot temperature is higher so the reading will be higher so that is how this liquid thermometer works as the temperature rises or falls, the liquid, the mercury, or alcohol expands or contracts. Amount of expansion can be matched to temperature on a scale. Okay, I'm going to show you a question regarding this later. To increase sensitivity, okay, I include this because this is very commonly asked. Increase sensitivity. So how can you increase the sensitivity? Make the capillary thinner. Use less dense liquid and then make a bigger bulb. So meaning to say, if you use a bigger bulb, there will be more liquids that will expand. How bigger bulbs? Because when you put or use a bigger bulb, it will have more liquids. So more liquids will expand here. And also it can detect more heat. Okay, so it will be more sensitive. Now, here's the question. Figure 4.1 shows a liquid in a glass thermometer without a temperature scale. So the liquid inside the thermometer has a melting point of negative 39 degrees Celsius. Now look at this. It could be in paper four or paper six. Describe a simple experiment to mark the position of the fixed points on this liquid in a glass thermometer. Okay, it can be from paper four or paper six question. So first thing, I have shown you this one before already. Place in the melting ice. You put this in a melting ice. Okay. Then you know that melting ice has a temperature of zero. So if it's stop, if it's stop, then that will be zero. So when the bits had stopped moving, mark as lower fixed point, which is zero degrees Celsius, because melting ice or the ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. Then Place in a steam above boiling water. So when bid stops moving as upper fixed point, put it as 100 degrees Celsius. It means if there is no reading in this thermometer, for you to calibrate it or to identify the fixed point, you have to put in melting ice. Let's say, for example, this is the melting ice. We labeled it zero degrees Celsius. It stops here. Then you put in uh, boiling water. So boiling water, it stops here. So this is 100 degrees Celsius. So those are the fixed points of a thermometer. Then from that, you can label it. The middle will be 50, then so on and so forth. If you just put it directly in the boiling water, cannot. Because the boiling water, if the, the temperature of that may be different, okay? In different portion of that, it may be different or different part. Okay, so you have to put it on top in the boiling water, so you'll see the temperature there. Okay, that is the exact way on how you're going to do or you're going to measure the temperature of that. Okay, next, the thermocouple thermometer. Most of the time, they, it will be two marks or three marks. They will just ask you to draw a thermocouple thermometer like this one voltmeter and then you have here iron and then copper 
And then you're asking before if we can use different metals. Actually, you can write here metal X or metal Y. As long as the metal that you're going to use here are different, that will be fine. Okay, so here is the question for this one. In the space provided, draw a label diagram of a thermocouple thermometer. This is three marks. So practice this one. You just have to draw something like this. Okay. You practice this kind of question, like drawing diagrams. And again, one more thing, students. If the question is asking you to write diagrams, they will, they will say it like this. You may, you may draw a diagram. I advise you to draw a diagram. Even if it's not required, I'm advising you to draw a diagram. So that even if your explanation is not that clear, if they saw it in the diagram, they'll give you mine. Okay. Next, the thermal capacity. So you know this one already. Specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kg of a certain substance or certain substance by one degree Celsius. Okay. They are giving you two marks if they ask you this question. What is specific heat capacity? So you just have to write there is energy required to raise a temperature. Now, you have to look at this one, one kg. That is what they're going to look for. If it's a specific capacity or if specific heat capacity, you have to write there one kg. If it's a specific latent heat, there should be one kg. It is specific in one kg. Like that. So next, the formula is C is equal to Q over M divided by uh, Q divided by M delta T. Delta T means change in temperature. Then thermal capacity or Q is the amount of energy. Sometimes it is written as E because it is energy. Okay. It's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of an object by one degree Celsius. So it doesn't have the specific value of one kg. If it's thermal capacity, it's not asking or it's not requiring the one kg. Okay, but for a specific heat capacity, they're going to look for that one kg. Okay, so this is the question for this one. An electrical heater is placed on the floor of a room in a house that heater is switched on. State the main process by which the thermal energy is transferred to the air. What do you call that? Air, gas. What's that? What do you call the heat transfer in gas? Is it conduction, convection, or radiation? Okay, so that is convection. So convection. Then the heater has a power of 1.5 kilowatt. The air in the room has a mass of 65 kg. So this is a common question here. They are not going to ask you directly. They will always give power, sometimes energy. They'll ask you to solve time like that, or they're going to ask you to solve temperature or mass. So it's not always direct. Most of the time in this topic, they're asking, or they, they are requiring you to use two formulas. They're requiring, requiring you to use two formulas. Let's say, for example, the heater has a power of 1.5 kilowatt. Since you are using pencil, I want you to write, or I'm advising you to write, what are the measurements present there? Let's say, for example, it's 1.5 kilowatt. So this is power because it's watts. But you have to convert that into watts. So this is 1.5 kilowatts. So that is 1,500 watts. Then 65 kg, this is the mass. I want you to label it like that. Then this is a uh, specific heat capacity. So this is T. Then calculate the time it takes. You are going to identify the time given the temperature. So these two are the temperature. So you cannot solve it directly. You cannot solve the time directly. It's always like this. They will ask you to do two computation. They are requiring you to do or to use two formulas for this one. So the first thing you need to do, you analyze the question and then you think of the formula of these two, how you can get the time. So of course you need, it is about heat or specific heat capacity. So you know the formula, which is E is equal to MC delta T, MC delta T. 
or change in temperature. Okay? Again, write the formula. Even if you don't know how to solve, you write the formula. You'll get marks on that. Then, the other one, power and time, power and time, since you have the energy, it will be energy or power is equal to energy divided by time. So you can solve the time later. Let's solve the energy first. A is equal to the mass, 65 times C, which is 720, then times change in temperature. It's always final minus initial, like this. So E is equal to, you solve the energy first. So 65 times 720 times 15 minus 8. And you'll get 3276. Zero, zero joules. So you'll get mark already on that. You write the formula, you'll get the answer for this one, you'll get the mark. But even if you're just going to write the formula, you'll get the mark. So you know the power, which is 1,500. You know the energy, which is 3,276, 327600 divided by the time. So this will be time is equal to 327600 divided by 1500. So time will be like that. So you solve 327600 divided by 1500. What's the answer? Okay. 218.4 seconds. You look at this is four marks. Four marks. So you expect that this is a quite tough question. There's many, many procedure on how you're going to answer this kind of question. Okay. Four marks. So probably it requires two formula, two procedures on how you're going to do it. Because if it's just easy, two marks only. It's four marks. So you have to think about that. Then when doing these calculations, whatever the calculations it is, I want you or I'm, I'm advising you to label each given. So power mass, specific heat capacity, temperature. I want you to label it like that since you can use pencil in answering the question. Okay, so in that way you will see or you will have an idea what formula you are going to use. Okay, class. So I think that is for today or for this session. And if we still have time for, let's say, uh, we, will, we can schedule another session for this. So we can continue. Okay, so that's all for today class for this session. Bye bye. Thank you everyone for joining and see you again next time. Back to you, Mr. Romel and Ms. Sims. Are you still there? Okay, thank you everyone. You can watch the video on Facebook page. Okay, so if you want any clarification or if you want to ask question, you can message me on WhatsApp or if something is not clear here, you watch the video. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you, everyone. Good luck for your exam. Yes, I will. I will reply. Bye bye. Yeah. Yeah.